Thinking Through the Word. We are in Nahum, chapter 1, Old Testament, Minor Prophets, Nahum, chapter 1. Here we find that Nahum the prophet is giving the word of the Lord against Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. Now, let's think through a brief timeline. 750, and this is BC, is Jonah prophesying the word of the Lord to Nineveh, a message of repentance. He simply wandered through the city proclaiming that salvation is of the Lord. Nineveh repents, and there is a revival for several decades. By 722 BC, the northern tribes are conquered by the Assyrian Empire and taken captive. In 701 BC, General Sennacherib invades the southern tribes of Judah. And you could read of that account in 2 Kings 19. And there the angel of the Lord kills 185 of the Assyrian soldiers in the night, giving victory to God's people. Well, somewhere around 650 BC, Nahum is prophesying. We know it's after 663, that's the fall of Thebes in Egypt, which Nahum actually references in chapter 3 in verse 8, when he says to Nineveh, are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her? Her rampart, a sea, and water, her wall. Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. Put and the Libyans were her helpers, yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. So the fall of Thebes is referenced. So we know Nahum prophesied after that, and then somewhere before 612 BC when Nineveh falls. What is the indictment? Well, here in verse 2, we begin to get a sense of what's going on. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. Avenging, and in that avenging, he is wrathful. And he takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for all his enemies. Nineveh has moved from that realm of repentance and knowing God's mercy to stubborn sin and deserving God's wrath. Historically, for Nineveh, it has been proven true that the Lord is slow to anger. Go back and read Jonah's account. Great in power, again. After all, God created the great fish to swallow up Jonah. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, again. The story of Jonah and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Uh, This language is being used to help us understand that God is in the place of judgment. He has the power to judge. He has the right to judge. The indictment comes to us later in chapter three in verse one in just a simple introductory phrase. Woe to the bloody city all full of lies and plunder. It's a brief summary, but I think that's because there are a few hundred years of history which testify against Nineveh. They were a vicious and ruthless people, known for their brutality and for their torture tactics. They likely devised the early forms of crucifixion, which would have involved some kind of impaling of the victims. And God is going to judge them for their, for the evil of their brutality. So that's the prophecy of Nahum. You could read chapters two and three and you'll see much of the language of the judgment of God on this people. A nation, a city that once knew great mercy and salvation has now rejected that truth 
and is in line for great judgment on sin. But our focus is chapter one, and I want to show you two significant gospel clues in chapter one. First, I want us to begin in verse five, where we read, the mountains quake before him, the hills melt, the earth heaves before him, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. So we're asked, who can stand before him? Who can endure? Well, those questions imply that no one can. We can't do that because we, like Nineveh, are guilty. Oh, our sin may look different, but it's still sin against God and we are guilty. We cannot stand. We cannot endure. And yet, by the time we read on to verse 7, we find the Lord is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Verse 6 We can't stand before him. We cannot endure his anger. And yet in verse seven, because of his goodness, we can take refuge in him as a stronghold in the day of trouble. So we can't stand before him, but we can take refuge in him. We are guilty, yet saved. There's an interesting link in our verses here to the New Testament story of the actual crucifixion of Christ, where this reality takes place, where we cannot stand before him, and yet we find him to be our stronghold. You could read of it in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, where the Bible says the curtain of the temple was torn in two, when Jesus dies on the cross. From top to bottom, it's torn, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. So that's a significant description of the upheaval, of the, of the turmoil, of the very geology of the terrain there. Here in Nahum chapter 1, We've just heard about mountains quaking and hills melting. And then in the next verse, the rocks being broken into pieces by him. When the wrath of God is poured out, this is what happens. Rocks are broken into pieces. In other words, how can a sinner stand before God if even the mountains and the rocks are no match for the power of his wrath? And so it is in Matthew 27, as the wrath of God is poured out on sin, that the rocks are split to remind us of that awesome weight of judgment. But the truth of that story in Matthew 27 is that that wrath was poured out on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in the place of sinners. And that is good news to us, that we can't stand before the crushing weight of God's wrath, and yet, because of God's goodness, he is a stronghold to all who take refuge in him in the day of trouble. And that day of trouble is the judgment day. So that's our first gospel clue. A couple of verses loaded with gospelly significant language. But there's a second verse I want us to see, and that's the last verse of chapter 1, verse 15. Behold the mountain, upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah, fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Keep your feasts simply means celebrate or rejoice, be glad. 
all is well because of him who brought the gospel, the good news, peace. Who can stand? Who can endure? And now we're talking about peace, reconciliation. We would also have to read Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, where the prophet Isaiah says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Good news. Because the wrath of God is poured out on Christ, who dies on the cross, is buried in a tomb, who rises from the dead and who sits on a throne, the gospel message is also a gospel of the reign of Christ, as well as the ransom and the redemption by Christ. And so the great message of the gospel is your God reigns. And so keep your feasts and celebrate. Well, two conclusions from Nahum chapter one and really all of his prophecy, chapters one through three. Nahum's name means comfort. Comfort. And his message is one of comfort for two reasons. Number one, because there is great condemnation for those who are God's enemies. That's the essence of the judgment against Nineveh. It is a reminder that there is great condemnation for those who are God's enemies. And God's people can find a comfort in the fact that God will vindicate them, that he will vindicate righteousness, that he will judge the wicked. So it's a message of comfort because there is great condemnation for those who are God's enemies. But it is also a message of comfort because, number two, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he forgives our sin so that we no longer fear the wrath of God. It has been spent. It has been satisfied. Spent on the righteous Christ in our place satisfied by the righteousness of Christ and his suffering on the cross. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You've heard the voice of him on the mountains who brings the good news and announces peace. So be comforted. Nahum, One seven reminds us that the Lord is good. In him, we take refuge. He is our stronghold. So from this book that has a lot to do with history, a lot of connections to the historical event of the rising and falling of empires, here we find a great message of comfort that God has made a way for sinners through Jesus Christ to take refuge from the wrath that he pours out on sin. Rejoice, rejoice in the sufficient work of Jesus Christ and in him know grace and peace.